And I've been flying the Mavic 3 since it came out pretty much every single day. And a lot of those days was like eight to 12 batteries. So I've really finally been able to fine tune where this thing uh, sits. And especially now that DJI has given us some more fine tuned controls over the gain and the expo of like cine mode, normal mode, sport mode. Uh, I wanna show you what I set mine up to be to get the maximum amount of control, especially in sport mode, uh, to be able to get you know the best, smoothest footage, even when you're moving fast. Because when you're doing stuff like this, you everything's moving super fast, and any little jerks, anything like that, totally ruins your shot. So if you can keep your movements smooth, even though you're pushing the drone at basically its top speed, it really can give you some dramatic footage. So let's jump into all of the settings, camera settings, everything that I use uh, for the Mavic 3 and the Mavic 3 Pro and what you can set yours to. First off, running around the screen real quick, you have what mode it's in. If you tap on the arrow, it'll take you out of the app, but then you can tap up here. That'll give you any error codes, anything like that. You can quickly set your return to home altitude. If you want to, I usually leave mine around 300 feet. You can set the max altitude. Some uh, places you are able to fly up to a thousand meters or a little over 3000 feet and you can set the max distance you want to go. Here's where you can also format your SD card or your internal storage if you happen to be flying the Cine. I'm not gonna do that because I shot a bunch of stuff today and I'm gonna lose it. Next up, you have your battery percentage there and as soon as you take off, that will change and that'll also give you a timer there. And then you have your RC signal strength and then that next one is very important because that is your obstacle avoidance. So if it's on, then you will see it turn white when it's in operation, when you're flying. But if it's red while you're flying, even though you see some warnings on the screen, it may not actually be active. So you need to pay careful attention to whether that's red or white when you're flying. And we have how many GPS satellites you get. It's important to get as many GPS satellites as you can and to wait for the drone to say the home point has been updated because then you know it has a good GPS lock. Otherwise, you could end up in a fly away situation. Then below that, you have your different camera selection. The Mavic 3 and the Mavic 3 Pro have, they have slightly different cameras, but you can choose between 1X and 7X on the Mavic 3 or 1X, 3X and 7X on the Mavic 3 Pro. And then next to that, you have your button to be able to choose between photo, video, master shots, quick shots, hyperlapse mode, pano modes. You can go into night mode, you can go into explore mode, slow motion, any of those sorts of things right there. Uh, we definitely don't need to be in night mode because it is not dark out here. There we go. Then you have your autofocus, manual focus toggle switch, which you can also manually move uh, in and out depending on which, how you want to focus. Autofocus generally works fairly well on this drone, so you don't necessarily need to put it in manual focus very often. I found that once in a while, I do have to put it in manual focus to make sure to get it, especially on the, the more telephoto cameras, um, to get it to focus on what I want it to focus on. You have your record start and stop button, play button so you can pull up and look at footage that you've shot recently. And then coming down, you have the mode button for if you're gonna be in all auto mode or in pro mode, I generally shoot in pro mode, but if you're not very familiar with flying drones and video photo work, then just use auto mode. It does a pretty decent job by itself. Now if we tap anywhere here, it's gonna open up all of these areas here. So here you can set your white balance. You can do auto where it'll set it automatically. And then you can basically lock it by turning auto off or you can set it manually. Um, I found in general, if you hit auto, the drone does a pretty good job of finding the correct white balance within reason. So, and then I lock it because as you move and change, it could cause the white balance to change in the drone. Then here you have your resolutions that you can shoot and your frame rates that you can shoot in those resolutions. Now, if you go to 4K or Cinema 4K, which is what the C4K stands for, uh, you'll notice that you can't shoot 4K 120. That's because that is specifically in the slow motion modes, not in the standard mode. And then you have how much storage is left on your SD card or the um, SSD, depending on what one you're doing again. And below that, you have your normal color, HLG color, D-Log and D-Log M color profile. You can turn the color display assist on or off, which I leave on because it's much more useful. And then you can switch to H.264, H.265 or ProRes if you have the Cine version. 
H.264 is the codec you want to use if you use an older computer because that's a little easier for computers to decompress when, they're work when you're working with editing the footage. H.265 has a little bit better quality to it, but it's also a little more compressed. So it makes it a little bit harder on your computer to work. And then ProRes, if you have the Cine version, is a much larger file format, has a lot more data, does look a little better. And definitely if you're working with somebody who's going to really heavily color grade the footage or match it up to other color cameras, that's the way to go. But honestly, in a side-by-side -side comparison, especially like for social media stuff, you really can't tell the difference. And then ProRes 422 LT, 422 or 422 HQ. Uh, I generally, unless I'm shooting for a TV show or something like that, I shoot LT, ProRes LT, because it's half the data, half the amount of data that ProRes HQ is. And the difference is really pretty minimal. And actually, I think even occasionally I've shot ProRes LT for a TV show too. Now, if you tap over to the shutter icon or the little aperture icon, then you can change your ISO. Uh, you can change your shutter speed, which you should try and keep your shutter speed at two times your frame rate. And then you can change your aperture or you can put it on auto aperture and uh, let it kind of decide what it wants to do by, you know, for you. Um, I generally run everything manually. I think I said that already. And then we keep going across. You have the distance you've traveled, how many feet away from your takeoff point you are, how high you are. And then just above that, you have how fast you're going forward or sideways, depending on which way the drone is moving. Basically, how fast you're moving horizontally and how fast you're moving vertically. And then next to that, you have a radar map that you have a couple of different options. Nothing, you can turn that on, which is kind of cool because when you get to an obstacle, you'll see lines start to show up around the drone. Uh, and then you can switch to an actual map. And if you have internet connectivity or if you've downloaded a map previously, it'll show a lot more detail right there. I generally like this one the best because it's fairly easy to find your way home because you can always see your H, which is your home point. Here's where we dive into the deeper menus. So if you tap the three little dots at the top right corner of the screen, you will come into a bunch much deeper menu. So here you can decide if you want your obstacle avoidance to bypass objects it finds or find a flight path around. You can have it do normal mode or nifty mode. Nifty mode tends to make smoother movements so it looks a little more cinematic if you're filming, say having it track you as you walk through trees or something like that. Or you can have it just stop and break uh, or you can turn it off at your own risk, obviously. You can tell it to display or not display the radar map for everything that is around the drone that the drone is sensing, which is, I find pretty useful, especially if I'm like trying to start really close to something. It gives you a good idea of how close to something you are, because it can be pretty deceiving with the wide angle lens. And then you can decide if you want it to just preset, like fly a straight path back to you and the home point, or if you want it to find more of an optimal return to home point, depending on like, you know, if there's objects or something between you and the drone, which there really shouldn't be. You can set your uh, return to home altitude. You can update the home point. This is important because you do need some sort of cellular connection or a, another GPS source. So you like hotspot to your phone if you're using this kind of a remote. If you're not using this kind of a remote, then actually all you need to do is just update the home point because your phone already has GPS built into it. That's really useful if you're doing something like following yourself in a moving vehicle, which in a, the US you can do that over sparsely populated areas. But if you're tracking, you know, you and your friend are driving a car and you're in the passenger seat following the car as you're driving through, it's good to update the home point every once in a while because the drone is basing how much battery power it has on and how much flight time it has on how far away from the home point it is because it knows it has to go back to the home point at a critical low battery point uh, or set or whatever. Uh, so if you update the home point, all of a sudden you'll find you have a lot more flight time because the drone thinks the home point is much closer, which it is. Um, so that's especially important to do from moving vehicles, especially if you're on a boat out in the middle of the ocean or a lake because the boat's moving. You don't want the drone to fly back out to wherever you took off from and then auto land into the water. You can set your max distance, calibrate your compass and your IMU. I don't calibrate these unless the app tells me to. I found that the drone operates really well that way. Every once in a while though, it has asked me to calibrate the compass either because we're around, you know, in a city or something like that, um, where there's a lot more interference, magnetic interference, it'll ask me to calibrate. So here you can find battery information, including the serial number and how many times the battery has been discharged and charged. Whoops. And then you can choose your auxiliary LED, auto on or off and the front arm LEDs. 
which in auto mode, they will turn off when you're shooting to make sure it doesn't interfere with the video. And then you can also do find my drone, which will show you at least the last location that your drone knew where it was and transmitted to the remote. So if you lose your drone in the woods, you might be able to find it using that. And then there's advanced safety settings, which is what do you want it to do if you lose signal with the controller? You can have it descend, you can have it hover or return to home. Return to home is good. And then in emergencies and emergency only, you can push the sticks down and together or down into the outsides. And after, I think it's about three seconds, the drone will quit and fall out of the air. Also handy if you land and the motors won't quit, then just keep those down into the center and it eventually will stop. Here's where you can turn, at least in the US, you can turn AirSense on and off. And what AirSense does is listens to ADS-B that is transmitted by manned aircraft and then lets you know if a manned aircraft is in the area, how close it is and that you need to move out of the way. The cool thing is when you do have it on, um, there's no aircraft right now, but when you do have it on, it will show you on the map where the aircraft is in relation to where your drone is when you pull up the map and where the aircraft is headed. So it is kind of handy. I generally don't use it because uh, it just it gets in the way of what I'm doing and I am very cognizant of the aircraft that are around me anyway. But if you're flying in a heavily trafficked area, it's not a bad idea. The next up we have control tab where you have information about the aircraft. You can do metric um, meters, kilometers or imperial. I'm sorry, I'm in the US, so I do Imperial. Uh, you can turn subject scanning on and off, but you have to be um, in the air and then also be in uh, a normal video recording. It doesn't work in a log format. And we're gonna come back to gain in Expo tuning, but you can touch or use the gimbal in F follow mode or FPV mode. If you use FPV mode, when you move the drone to the left or the right, the gimbal is going to bank left or right. So don't really want to do that. And you can calibrate the gimbal, recenter the gimbal there, decide if you want stick mode two, which is what I use. And I think most people use, but if you're used to a different mode where say the throttle is over on the left stick or right stick, uh, then you can switch it there. And you can also customize the buttons here, the C1, C2, C3 button, or depending on the remote you have, which buttons you have, and you can customize it there. Um, you can calibrate the RC there and repair or relink the aircraft with the remote there as well. And the way to relink it on the drone is you turn the drone on and then you push and hold the power button after it's on completely for I think uh, seven seconds or so and it'll start beeping and then you can relink to the, the remote here. Now, the gain in Expo tuning is where uh, it's really important to set things up for your drone and the way you fly. So me, for example, I like to generally fly pretty slow. Um, in cine mode, I'll have these kind of all at about 2.2. But if I'm tracking or if I'm flying and filming myself and I want it to follow me, then I'm generally up at like three and a half to four because that's about how fast I walk or if I'm you know, following a walker, uh, somebody who's walking, then you can set it there. But I generally, everything about cine mode is pretty slow. My angular velocity, the smoothness, the sensitivity, and then my Expo, 0.25, 0.25, I actually don't think I changed much of this from DJI, um, except for the speeds. And then in normal mode, I have everything turned up pretty much as far as it'll go in normal mode. At 75, same, I, don't, I guess I really didn't change much of this. I actually don't fly in normal mode that often anymore. I fly mostly in cine mode or in sport mode. So then sport mode, I like to go as fast as possible because that's just the way I like to fly. The angular velocity, brain six, brake sensitivity. Uh, if you turn brake sensitivity up like to 150, it's gonna stop much faster when you stop moving that stick. So, um, you know, 100 is pretty good, but if you're gonna fly like right out towards something and stop at the last minute, I don't recommend doing it, but if you are going to do that, then turn that brake sensitivity all the way up. And then for Expo, this is in, this is where I've ended up. It's 0.35 for the roll and pitch, 0.25 for the yaw, and up and down being 0.3. The speed control for the tilt of the gimbal is at 30 and the tilt smoothness is at 10. Again, this is gonna vary depending on you and your drone a little bit, but once you kind of lock this in, then go out and fly a ton because nothing will replace you getting to know the feel of your drone. So fly, just go out and fly a lot and that'll help you lock in the feeling 
and knowing how much or uh, how little pressure to apply on stuff to get what you want or get to get the drone to do what you want. Camera. So here you can choose your format. Uh, if you're in ProRes, it's gonna be MOV, but if you're in other modes, uh, then you can do it in um, .mp4 or .mov. It, it, that really doesn't matter too much. I just, MOV is good. Video subtitles. If you find a whole bunch of extra files when you pull the footage off the SD card or off the drone and you see a whole bunch of extra ones, the video subtitles are essentially all of the information that the drone is recording at the time. So it's direction, it's speed, GPS coordinates, the camera settings, ISO, shutter speed, aperture, all of that is recorded in video subtitles. And then you can use a program like uh, Handbrake or VLC Media Player, I think it's VLC Media Player, with that to see what your settings were on a certain shot and what the drone was doing. So it is kind of handy, I leave mine on, but if you don't like the extra files, then you can turn them off there. Anti-flicker. I leave an auto because it does a good job on its own. And then histogram. The histogram is uh, this little white square here that comes up and tells you kind of the distribution of where everything is from left being the darkest stuff to right being the brightest stuff. And then where uh, all the stuff in your photo or in their, your video kind of lines up in between there. So if you see everything stacked up against one side or the other, you need to adjust your exposure. And you can turn on, uh, oh, you can turn on the peaking level for uh, focus. Let's see if I does that. I think I have to put it manual focus. And then you can see kind of what's in focus and what's not in focus. Um, and then you can also turn on your overexposure warning, which today being a very bright day, there's a lot of overexposure warning. So you know those whites are going to be a little overexposed. I do find the overexposure warning is a if you're if you're filming in D-log is way off. So you don't want to use it if you're filming in D-log, but if you're filming in normal color profile, it will give you a very good idea of what is overexposed and what's not. A D-log has a lot more dynamic range and that's why I typically film in D-log. Here you can turn your grid lines on and off and your center point on and off and your diagonal points on and off. These are very useful if you're gonna be doing lots of manual movements around an object and you wanna keep it in the same place. Helpful that way. Uh, again, white balance and then your storage. USB mode, which if you're using the Cine is great, um, but pretty, I guess anything, if you turn USB mode on like I do, then when you plug the drone into a computer to pull the footage off, either the SSD or the SD card, either one will work, the drone will power everything else down so it's not transmitting the engines aren't running or the motors aren't running all of the uh, internal flight controller all of that is in a low power state so it keeps the drone from getting too hot and it just keeps it a lot a lot easier to uh, manage if you're going to be pulling footage off of the drone for quite a while you can name custom folders um, and then you can name files which i right now need to change mine because it's uh, ridiculously long but it basically gives you the DJI, the month, the day, the year, and then whatever file number it is, which I guess can be useful. And then uh, you can cache when recording, which means the what you're viewing on the screen gets cached onto your remote controller or your phone, depending on which one you have. And that can be useful if you lose the drone for some reason. You still have a recording of whatever you were filming, and it might help you find the drone. Uh, and in my case, when I did not get a drone back because it went down inside of a glacier, um, I at least had what I'd recorded that day in 1080p, which is what it records to. So and you can decide how much you want your maximum uh, memory you want that to use before it starts overwriting the old files. Then you have transmission here. For the most part, it's uh, the auto works great. You can like enter live streaming platforms if you want to. For here, if you have this and the HDMI out, you can decide if you want it to mirror the screen, which means it shows all the control information, or live view, which is a clean HDMI feed. If you're doing live TV or something, you want the live view for sure. You can also decide if you want it to operate on both the 2.4 and the 5.8, or just one or the other. If you're really having trouble going very far, you might look and see if maybe you know the 5.8 or the 2.4 is really busy in that particular area, especially if you're in cities or dense RF environments. And then you can have channel mode in manual or auto. I leave it in auto, it does a good job overall. And then over here, you have all of your information for like serial numbers, the battery serial number, the flight controller serial number, um, app version number, and all of that. 
that gives you a really good starting point for the Mavic 3 Classic, the Mavic 3 or the Mavic 3 Pro. Obviously, there's differences between them, but the drone itself, the way it flies, the way it handles is pretty much the same across the board. You just need to tweak it for each drone as they are slightly individually different and your flying style might also be a little different than mine. But if you want to learn ways that you can improve your video or your photos with your drone, click or tap right there. I'll see you over there as always. If you have questions, ask me in the comments below or join my live stream, which happens most Wednesday nights at 4 p.m. Alaska time, 8 p.m. Eastern when I'm not out in places like this. I'll see you again soon in the next video. Cheers.